Paul R. Hill's book, Unconventional Flying Objects, is probably the best written tome on the subject by a credentialed scientist. I read it with no expectation, but was surprised to find a few insights that I was not already aware of. Here you have a man stepping up to the plate and actually fouling off a few pitches. In general, when a scientist steps up to the plate in the UFO field, all he gets is beamed by fellow scientists throwing the party line at him. In my other video, I said he was trying to save linear momentum conservation at the expense of energy conservation. This isn't quite right. He was trying to save linear momentum conservation and energy conservation while ignoring the second law of thermodynamics. He proposed that the energy would be provided by converting matter directly into the kinetic energy of the craft. I presume they didn't want to show a calculation of the actual energy needed in an example because it's too daunting. And he certainly did not calculate the power output required to maintain a high G acceleration to near light speeds either. That too is daunting, to say the least. If you examine the power output needed, you run up against the second law of thermodynamics, which is all but forgotten by propulsion investigators. That is, if you have any type of machine, any type at all, it can't be 100% efficient, or you're tossing out the second law. Therein lies the difficulty. Something must go. If you save momentum and energy conservation, you must resort to a magical energy supply that violates the second law. If you want to save all three laws, your craft is hoisted on its own petard. It incinerates itself by excess of power output. Let us proceed again to examine UFO propulsion in the light of the first two laws of thermodynamics. In a straightforward reaction propulsion system of constant acceleration, the energy of the payload increases by 2n minus 1 times in each time increment. So if we output an energy of 1 unit after 1 second, after 10 seconds, that payload will experience an energy increase of 2 times 10 minus 1, or 19 units of energy in the 10th second. We then ask if we are generating a constant acceleration from a more or less constant power output, how can we add 19 units of energy in the tenth second when we only got one in that first second? Intuitively, it appears that we ought to have an increase of only one more unit of energy in the tenth second, since the payload mass is constant and the acceleration is constant. Here is the bookkeeping for reaction propulsion. Suppose you have two identical masses with a big compressed spring between them. You release the spring, and the two masses are thrown in opposite directions, each with one unit of energy at one unit velocity. The total energy output is then two units from the spring. Now, suppose you do the same thing with the two masses, only this time they are passing you at ten units of velocity, instead of being at rest. Then the energy of each mass is 100, 10 squared. When we release the spring, the lead mass goes to 11 units of velocity and 121 units of energy for a gain of 21 units of energy, 2n minus 1, instead of the 1 unit of energy in the first example. But look then at the other mass, which is now considered the propellant. It has gone from 10 units of velocity to 9 units of velocity and 100 units of energy down to 81 units of energy. It has lost 19 units of energy. Subtracting this lost energy from the other's gain, 21 minus 19 equals 2 units of net energy gain. This is the same as the energy output of the first example. Thus, in the straight-up reaction propulsion system, the system output energy is constant, even though the payload energy is increasing relative to an observer 2n minus 1 times in each subsequent time interval. No bookkeeping problems here, as long as you carry your propellant with you. However, in Paul Hill's gravitational coupling system, whether it's with the Earth or Sun, 
No measurable energy is generated in the propellant, which is the planetary body itself. Hence, all the kinetic energy of the craft originates within the spacecraft. This is because energy does not go off equally in opposite directions, as does momentum. My example of the moon as propellant shows that the energy imparted to an extremely large body when used in any gravitational coupling system is so small as to be non-existent from any physics perspective. The kinetic energy imparted to the moon is proportional to mv squared instead of mv. So, 10 to the negative ninth joules for the moon is far, far less than 10 to the tenth joules for the saucer. In fact, the energy imparted to the moon by the gravitational coupling reaction is less than the energy of a fly beating its wings once. Essentially, all of the energy outputted from the saucer's power unit goes into its own kinetic energy. Thus, when we use a substantial planetary body to push off of, the 2n-1 multiplier means that to balance the energy books, we have to increase the energy output of the saucer's power plant by 2n-1 times for each time increment. Before, the 2n-1 multiplier made sense because the propellant was carried forward with the payload and received a negative energy change justifying a 2n-1 energy increase in the payload. But now, if you don't carry the propellant with you, you are subject to the second law of thermodynamics. That is, the excess of energy given off by your power plant needed to supply the ever-increasing energy of the saucer requires that the power plant's inefficiency will quickly incinerate the saucer unless the power is cut back drastically. It simply can't keep up a constant acceleration when coupled to the Earth or Sun or any other large planetary body. The first law of thermodynamics runs the saucer right into a wall formed by the second law of thermodynamics. So we can state with conviction that if the first and second laws of thermodynamics are correct, then the gravitational coupling method is useless for interplanetary space travel, though it may be of some limited use within the atmosphere subject to second law restraints. Now let's try something else in the reaction propulsion venue. Let's suppose that we are able to create antimatter, the best possible fuel for space travel, and we can create it in abundance. How much would we need for a reasonable travel time to a star 10 light years distance in a reasonably sized vehicle independent of Earth? I'm going to go for one tenth light speed for a 100 year travel time. And let's take the trip in a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier-sized cigar-shaped mothership of 100,000 metric tons. That's what a Nimitz-class carrier displaces. And let's accelerate at 1g. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? Our top speed will be 30 million meters per second. Our craft's mass is 100 million kilograms. Our acceleration will be 10 meters per second per second, rounded up from 9.8. To get up to speed, we'll take 30 million meters per second divided by 10 meters per second per second equals 3 million seconds, and that's about 833 hours, or about 35 days. Our kinetic energy at top speed will be 4.5 times 10 to the 20 second joules. And that energy, in turn, is equal to about 10 million one megaton hydrogen bombs. The fuel required to get to one-tenth light velocity using Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation is 10,517,100 kilograms of mixed half-matter, half-antimatter, or about 10,000 metric tons, or about one-tenth the mass of the craft. 